Hello everyone and welcome back to uh, day 22 of Bitwise where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. So uh, last last time on day uh, 21, uh, I in my rather sleep deprived state finished off with a RISC-V intro and gave an overview of what I was planning on doing with Bitwise for the um, for the coming weeks. And um, you know the, the plan was to start working on um, you know the basic toolchain components um, for for a RISC-V system like simulator or emulator, um, assembler, disassembler, debugger, stuff like that. Um, and uh, and so today, uh, that's really what we'll be getting into as the main topic. And uh, depending on how I'm feeling at the end of the stream, we may continue with an extra stream to get some serious work done, since this is kind of the the groundbreaking for that new set of work, uh, and I want to kind of get some momentum on it. But uh, we'll, we'll see how tired I am by the end of the stream. But anyway, before we get to that, um, I do just want to review all the changes that went into ION um, since last time, because things have been moving very quickly and are really, really coming together. Uh, and so I do want people to get a chance to see that work so that uh, maybe, you know, on the one hand, they can see how a increasingly professional quality tool is kind of coming together a bit by bit. Um, and, and maybe it will entice people to actually try it out for themselves. So um, uh, the the big thing is, well, there's a few things. The so one is that it has a proper command line interface now. So let me um, let me show you. Um, so I didn't break it. Um, if you uh, if you run it now, there's there's different flags. Um, as before, if you just call it with a package name, it will treat that as the main package. Um, I, I turned. I mentioned in the last stream that it was doing this kind of lazy reachability thing for only compiling symbols as uh, as needed based on what was referenced from the main package. That's now off by default, just because I already ran into annoying issues trying to work on non-main packages uh, and, and not having my col uh, code code get included, even though I was trying to sort of test it. Um, so now it's off by default, but um, if you use dash lazy, um, you uh, you will enable it the way it was last time, and um, you can see here uh, that there's a major drop in the number of symbols. And if you want to see exactly what symbols those are, you can use verbose. So also the it spams you much less by default. If you want to see the whole spiel, you can use dash verbose. Um, so you can see with lazy, this is the set of symbols. Um, with without lazy, um, oops. Without lazy, you get you get all kinds of libc symbols that are visible to you, but are not actually uh, used by any of your code. So anyway, so so that's kind of, that kind of thing is in. Uh, the other big thing uh, you can see it here in the command line option, but uh, it's really reflecting a, a bunch of deeper work that went on in the compiler is that we now have proper support for different backend targets. So um, this is closing the loop on uh, stuff that was left open intentionally with, with plenty of to-dos along the way um, when we were working on the resolver especially. And so um, if you recall, there were several cases where we were hard coding um, the sizes and alignments of certain types, like the built-in types like int um, and pointer size, pointer alignment, and all this sort of thing. And um, all that stuff is now fully uh, moved into the back end. So the resolver itself doesn't hard code anything. Um, and if we look at type.c now, uh, so it used to be that all these static initializers for the built-in types just had like hard coded type metrics and then, you know, alignments and stuff like that. Um, uh, and, and they were hard coded for Windows X64 just because that was the platform I was on, but uh, that was always placeholder. So now that's fully externalized. Um, there's a type metric structure, which for each type specifies the data we care about. Um, so you can see it's not just the size and alignment, it's also whether something is signed. So for example, char is notorious for being a type that can be signed or unsigned on specific platforms. Um, and so that sort of thing is in the type metrics and also the maximum value, which we need to uh, infer types for literals according to C. So uh, all that stuff is externalized. Um, there's just this thing here that's an array of these type metrics that's indexed by the type kind enum. And um, by default, it's just null. And then the back end will fill it in with a pointer to a target specific table. Um, and then if you look at how this stuff is used, um, 
you know, for stuff like this, you can see to find out whether a certain thing is signed. Um, for most things, it's hard coded, but uh, for some cases like uh, char, it grabs it from the type metrics table. Um, same thing for pointer, size and alignment. Um, and, and this is the same as this function pointer. Uh, and then there's this thing here, which is where most of the properties get initialized, where at startup, after you've set up, uh, after the target uh, backend has set up its type metrics table accordingly, uh, you call init built-in types, and basically, um, aside from doing this stuff with assigning type IDs, it also fetches the size and alignment from the type metrics table. So this this stuff is now fully decoupled, and um, the case where you'll see this used with um, I mentioned type uh, I mentioned literals uh, being used um, where we need to use this max. Um, there there used to be a big to do here where instead of using uh, these backend specific type metrics for the maximum values representable by these different types, I had stuff like this, right? And I had a big to do. I knew uh, that this was always placeholder because basically if I use int max here, the int max that will be used is the constant from whatever thing I'm compiling, on the host system I'm compiling on, not the target system. Um, and so now all of that stuff is pulled uh, from the type metrics table. And so again, kind of closing the loop on some of the stuff we left open. Um, but you, I could have done some of that work earlier, but uh, I, I guess I'm bringing this up to emphasize, like I've seen people express that, um, I, I don't know, I keep deferring work. I keep saying I'll get back to stuff later. Um, and I think it makes certain people uncomfortable. I, I, I guess what I'll, all I can say is first off, based on experience, I have a good hunch about what is reasonable to, to defer and, and appropriate to defer and more optimal to defer. Um, versus what needs to be addressed in, in, in the immediate term. Um, and so I do wanna highlight these things where we get back and close the loop on things that were left open just to show that this was trivial for me to uh, to, 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 to refactor, to, to, to be driven by this metrics table rather than hard-coded constants. And it's because I was anticipating it and so it was pretty easy to, um, to just make those changes. And really that's the key for deferring work. You have to be able to anticipate what the work entails. You can't just be completely uh, in La La Land and, and be overly uh, engaged in wishful thinking about what it, wouldn't it be nice if you really need to be able to sort of anticipate uh, and, and squint your eyes and see what it would be like and then use that understanding to decide hey should I do the work now or can I defer it when it to when it's more appropriate um, and so I, I do want to highlight these cases where we come back and close the loop so people can hopefully see that this approach is actually viable but you do need to have the judgment to make those calls about whether something can be deferred and should be deferred anyway. Um, and then in terms of how that uh, data is filled in, there's now a targets.c file. And um, right now we have uh, three operating systems supported, Windows, Linux, and Mac. These are, uh, until we do RISC-V stuff, um, this is our set of targets. Uh, and similarly for architecture, x64 and x86 is what's supported. Um, so uh, here are the tables for the different ABIs we need to support. Um, there's a bunch of default metrics which are the same for everyone um, and then for specific uh, you know we have these i think three ta four tables um, where they fill in stuff um, extra that they need um, incidentally this is a good use of i mean you can argue about using a macro but it's nice that you can do this kind of out of order initialization for a, uh, a reinitializer uh, because it makes it very easy to get this kind of default macro and then only override specific fields after that. Um, so yeah, you can see that uh, on Windows, uh, you know, pointers are four, pointers are four, um, longs are uh, four. Uh, on on Windows, uh, on x64, pointers are eight, of course, but long is still four. So that's one of the things about Windows that's different from a lot of other platforms. Uh, and then you have here uh, ILP32. ILP stands for integer long pointer 32. So um, uh, integer is always 32 also on this LP64, but like this means you know, integer 32, which is part of the default metrics. Long and pointer are 32, meaning four bytes, right? 32 bits, four bytes. And that's reflected here. And then you have LP64, which stands for long pointer 64. That means pointers are 64 bits, but long is also 64 bits. So these are the, the different tables. And then when you do an init target, it just sets up this type metrics pointer to uh, to point to the right table, um, and that's about it. And uh, actually, um, 
let me do that because OS 10 is not supported on x60 uh, x86 anymore I think so um, we shouldn't be lying about that um, anyway and um, so to go along with that work um, I, I I did another feature so this was just kind of for the the, the resolver the kind of internal guts um, the other thing I added um, which is very heavily I mean directly almost carbon copied from go is um, being able to do conditional compilation of source files based on the target so uh, we don't have a C, we don't have something like the CP processor where you can do you know if def windows or whatever um, so we need some other mechanism for a low-level language like this to do conditional compilation in a way where you know certain platforms have uh, different things defined uh, or you know maybe the same symbols are available on every platform but they're defined slightly differently for their constant values or whatever or their specific types depending on um, depending on the target and so um, the way this works is um, um, there's basically file name filtering based on the current patterns um, where um, um, I'm using ion OS to which is also an environment variable you can use um, but uh, I'm just using this to stand for whatever the target architecture in OS is so when you're when you're deciding you can see an example right here in, in my column here in the built-in package um, if a file name ends in a, 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 an underscore separated component which matches one of the operating systems uh, or an architecture or this kind of two-parter um, then it's only included if that filter is compatible with the target so types underscore Linux is only compiled if ion OS is Linux uh, types Linux x64 is only compiled if you're on if you're targeting Linux and you're targeting x64 so this is a, 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 bro a broader a broader set of targets it covers any Linux target. This only covers a specific combination of OS and operating system. Uh, and similarly here, this only covers a specific architecture, but it works for any operating system. Um, and so um, th this is just some stupid string parsing to implement that. But this is called by the uh, by the package parsing code, which you know goes through uh, all the files in the directory that end in ion and um, calls this excluded target file name thing to decide whether to include it in the package. So that all works now. Uh, when, aside from being useful in user code, for me personally, just like working on the compiler, what this let me do is move, let me move a ton of, of type defs and other junk from the, um, from the C code where it was kind of hard coded, where I would manually put stuff in the symbol table, for example, uh, into, uh, into ion code that's conditionally compiled. So for example here, you can see uh, we have these type depths um, that correspond to 64-bit and 32-bit targets. Um, and this also let me do a bunch of testing using this approach. So I can use these static asserts that are only firing, you know, because they're inside this file that's uh, target filtered, it will only fire on that specific kind of target. So in this case, I'm asserting, not only am I defining these U size, S size, U input or input or things, but I'm also asserting that you know a pointer is 32 bits on x86, x86 and that it's uh, 64 bits on x64 and so on. Um, and uh, you know W char, uh, yeah. So basically, I assert that uh, I assert that all the things are as expected using this conditional compilation, which is a pretty nice way to do things. So um, and you can see here, this is another example where Every platform defines, uh, or there's, there are these globals called Ion Arch and Ion OS to kind of mirror the environment name variables, uh, environment variable names rather. Um, and originally I was generating these in the code generator. I was like, you know, grab the name of the OS and put it directly in the C code. But now that I have conditional compilation, I can just uh, do this thing here where they all, you know, they, they define the right value for it. So I was kind of shocked by how clean this worked out. Um, and again, because of this convention over configuration thing, all ion files in a given directory that match a package are sucked into the, comp the set of things that are compiled. And so when you add new files like this, you don't have to do any work. Like you don't have to add them to a build script or any other thing. It just gets slurped in, which is pretty neat. So um, uh, that was that was one big thing that happened. Um, there's other stuff I want to cover. Pretty substantial. Oh, okay, yeah. So this is a big one. 
Martin Cavanaugh, who is uh, who goes by the handle twice times on the chat and on Twitter and elsewhere, um, uh, made a great contribution uh, with uh, libc bindings. So previously, I just had a few bindings that I was using in my test that I had manually entered in this package. Um, but he actually went through and did a fairly sizable subset of the normal libc stuff. Uh, we're probably never going to have everything, um, but or maybe we will, but we're, we're getting we're covering the kind of stuff that I use personally, which you know selfishly is uh, is great. So um, you know, um, probably most of the thing, actually all of the things I'll show you in a second. I ported a bunch of code from C to Ion. And all this uh, libc stuff I needed was already here, so that was great. Um, one small note is that to kind of mirror the um, the change from C, where you know, if you recall, um, is a float in uh, Ion, but a double, um, but a double in C. Um, um, uh, you know, we, we flipped this convention, which I, I never liked in C, uh, where an unsuffixed float literal without an F is a float. And then if you want a double literal, you have to use D. Um, I made the same change with all the import names for uh, math.h. So rather than having to do a cos F, which is what the external name is in, in uh, math.h, the ion side version of that is a cos, and then if you want the double version, you put a d at the end. So it's kind of flipping the convention to mirror what we did with literals, and which personally um, I like. Um, I'm partial to it, obviously, but uh, I, I like this convention a lot. So all this stuff is in um, standard I/O. So there's file stuff, uh, including SN printf and all those nice C99 things. Uh, standard lib. So I guess there's malloc and all this stuff. Yeah, so a bunch of things here. Um, and there's also standard arg, which is, this is one I did, and I'll show that in a second because it uses some some interesting hacks to be possible because these are implemented in C with macros. And so I had to figure out a way to expose them to ion without macros since I don't want to do compiler support just for standard arg.h. But anyway, all of this is in. And uh, building on the back of this, I... Um, I decided, so kind of look, looking at everything we had, like the combination of having proper packages now and now having the libc stuff, I decided, hey, if you guys recall, we had a bunch of uh, all the stuff that was talking directly to SDL in Noir from uh, last week. Um, I had moved as much of as much of it as possible to to Ion, but there was still this Noir impl, uh, Noir impl.c file that had like 500 lines of code or so which was the code that was directly interfacing with SDL. And my motivation at the time was I didn't want to have to do bindings for SDL. Um, and so, but, but, but yesterday I just sat down and did bindings for a, a subset of SDL um, in order to get Noir ported. So it's not all of SDL. Um, it's just what I needed for Noir, um, but, it, but there's already a bunch of stuff in here. Um, and so I just went through and did it. Uh, and I guess the one thing I'll mention that was very convenient is that because we have the same literal syntax and you know enum like a lot of the syntax is very similar it's extremely easy to move stuff from the sdl headers over here without having to sort of rejigger things in your brain uh or do any kind of transformations it's uh it was an extremely smooth process um and then i actually went through and moved all the noir c code to ion so there are no more there's no more c code i mean this is the generated c code but there's no more uh kind of stuff we used to have like we used to have this uh we used to have something like this and then we also had source noir impul.c and this thing here was what was re directly responsible for calling sdl so all of this is gone now we just import sd this sdl package which in turn imp uh, imports the header um it has all the bindings we need, and then everything else that was in uh, in C is now in in Ion. So uh, basically, let me show you what was ported, just so you can get an idea of the scope. Um, I think it's all of this stuff here. So I guess 350 or so lines. All of this stuff here was um, 350 lines. All of this was ported to uh, to Ion. And the surprising, maybe not surprising, but one really nice finding is that um, when you already have C code that's co-compiling with Ion code the way we were doing with Noir, 
I, I was able to move a function at a time. So, you know, we had everything running with these two files that were co-compiling. Uh, the C code could see all of the ion code because all of the ion code was generating C declarations. So any of the C code could call into ion, but vice versa, not so easily, right? Because Noir needs a de forward declaration of, of any C symbol in order to be able to address it. But in the reverse direction, it was very trivial, which meant that I could take a leaf level function, leaf level meaning something that doesn't reference other stuff in C that's not visible in Noir, copy and paste it over to noir.ion, make the very small syntactic changes needed to make it compile because the languages are so similar in syntax. And then at that point, all I would have to do is go to the C file and change from, for example, uh, init time to noir underscore init time because it's package prefix in the C and the generated C code. And the code would just compile. And so I was able to move one function over to time, recompile, rerun, retest. And uh, at no time did I have some period of more than a minute or two where stuff wasn't compiling and running. Um, and so this is by far the smoothest experience I've ever had of moving stuff piecemeal ac across a language boundary like this. Um, pretty pretty surprised. And it also gave me hope that even if we have to do a bunch of manual porting work for the compiler, moving the compiler to be self-hosting eventually, which I hope to do 90% uh, automatically, but, my, my, but, but, but it gave me hope that even the remaining 10% would be very smooth if I have to do it manually. So that was a pretty great experience. Um, and it also exposed a few tiny type resolver bugs, nothing crazy, but just like small things it wasn't um, handling correctly. Um, nothing that required major changes, just small things that I'd overlooked. Um, and so this was a really good experience and it was cool just to see all that stuff now in here and it just worked. Uh, and the code got cleaner, you know, all these infer inferred things, uh, you know, uh, compound literals are, are shorter for us. Um, just, just pretty cool to see this stuff come over and everything just work. Um, so yeah, um, so that was done. And let me talk about the standard arg thing that I alluded to a second ago. So um, if you look at, um, you know, if you look at these macros for doing var arg stuff in C, um oh that's not i want the c version although i don't know if there's any difference um if you look at all these things here we're already using them in the ion compiler right like we're using them for all our error printing functions and all kinds of other stuff uh where uh, well i think we're not using va arg but we're using va start and va copy and va end in order to call v printf and vsn printf and stuff like that um so in C, all of these macros, I think a couple of them could be interpreted as functions, like uh, function-like macros, but there are a few things that are definitely not uh, directly transposable as a function. Because, for example, VA start requires a naked parameter name um, in order to, uh, to follow this, so if you wanted to just transport the signature over directly. And so one thing I was dreading is, man, I don't want to add, I want to have a more type safe mechanism for uh, using type IDs for doing, um, uh, for doing var args, ion specific var args eventually, and, and probably sooner than later. But I do also want to have a way of doing this naked stuff for interoperability. And I was like, man, I really don't want to have to add like new syntax or, or new semantics specifically for standard arg.h. That feels, that feels like, uh, for something that's just an interop thing that feels like a, a capitulation. So uh, I came up with something that uh, skirts the C standard slightly, um, but worked on all the compilers that I could find. And so let me show that to you. Let me first look, show you the signature. Uh, and I'll tell you, I'll show you the differences from the C versions of these signatures. Um, so, um, the first thing here you'll note is that even though these names alias the C names, uh, they're actually called something else on the C side. And I'll show you what these are defined to be in a second. Um, and the big difference is that you're always passing a pointer, uh, a non-const pointer to VA list for the first argument. You're not passing like an L value or something like that. You're passing a pointer. Um, and uh, notably for VA start, which is the most macro-like macro of the set, um, you pass the argument pointer, not the argument name uh, of the first argument, you know, before the var args list. Um, and 
this is the part that requires on the C side in order to accomplish this requires me to do things that are definitely not guaranteed by the standards definition of VA start. Um, the most interesting one uh, in a certain way is VA arg. So VA arg normally you normally the second argument of VA arg is a uh, is a type like just a type name like you can type int or whatever or int star uh, and the value of VA arg is something of that type as an R value so that you can do you know in C you can do int i equals VA arg ap int or something like that um, and again if we wanted to have that sy syntax verbatim we would probably need um, particularly the fact that the return value type is like it's not a pointer to something it's like a naked value of some polymorphic type like you can't really do that without either some weird situational polymorphism in the language hard or hard coded in the compiler or whatever so th this this one really needed to change in order to uh, fit the type system and so what i did was um, and i think this is actually kind of neater than the c version uh, in my opinion, in terms of the interface. But you still have this uh, args VA list uh, pointer, and then you have an any argument. So you recall that the any argument is um, is a built-in thing in type info. It's always available even if you don't compile in full type info. Um, it's just a combination of a void star, uh, and in this case, you can write through it, not just read from it, because it's not a const void star, um, and a type ID. And so basically the idea is that Rather than using this kind of return expression oriented VA arg style, you use this kind of destination oriented statement style where you say, make an any that corresponds to the location and the type of the argument you want to fill in, and then pass that to VA arg, and it will somehow do the right thing. Um, and so I can show you what the code looks like in practice in terms of how you use it. It looks very similar to C. So, um, you know, we already had support for, for these signatures, so that was already in. Um, so, you know, you have a VA list, you call VA start. The only difference from C is that you have to take the pointer of, of init args rather than just typing init args nakedly. Uh, we make another one, we do a copy over, and again, this is like using pointers rather than naked L values. Um, and then VA end again takes a pointer. So all of these take pointers just to be consistent. And um, then for VA arg, this is maybe the interesting one, is um, we declare this thing and then we do an any struct. So this is a compound literal that constructs an any. And so we take the address of the thing we want to fill in and then we take its type of. And same thing here. Um, and so this is pretty clean. Um, and also one of the nice things about this is that you can imagine that both of the, that this anything could have come in from another function. So another function could have indirectly said, hey, fill this fill in this thing. It has this R type. And you could, on their behalf, you could fill it in in this way, which um, is very convenient. Um, you wouldn't really have a direct way to do that in C because you can't express types as values that you can pass around as identifiers. Um, and so, yeah, so this is, you would, could, you know, the equivalent in C of this would be something like, um, you know, it would basically be, uh, I think, like this. So this is where there would be a change. Uh, you would do char um, int um, something like this. That would be the equivalent C code. So except for this VA arg, which, which is more changed, the rest of it is really just uh, taking pointers of things rather than passing names directly. Um, and then this changed a little bit more, but in a way that feels fairly idiomatic in ION. Um, and, uh, but, but more importantly, actually lets me implement something that, that works without compiler extensions. So uh, let me show you how this, well, first let me, let me just show you that it actually works. Uh, and that, then I will show you the implementation. Um, I have this at the startup project. Um, so yeah, we call this variadic function, whatever is just, you know, the format argument. So we're not going to care about that. And then there's a variable list of things here. We pass a char, an int, and a long. 
the pertinent thing is that um, this is subject on the C side to the so-called default argument promotions, which means that the default argument promotions are the integer promotions where stuff tends to get converted to int if, if they're kind of lesser than int, uh, plus uh, the, the, the convention that uh, floats are promoted to doubles. That's the other part of the default argument promotions. So anyway, let's step in. Okay, let's not step in. Let's step over, apparently, because I'm an idiot. Uh, let's step in. And um, if you look here in these variables, they're going to get filled in. Um, so now init arcs is filled in. And um, now we copy this over. You can see they're now the same. Uh, now we, we finish the other one, which nulls it out. Uh, and then we fill in arg, which is one, two, three. And we fill it in, which is one, two, three, one, two, three. And we fill in long, which is, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three, some big thing. And then we print it and we finish. Now, um, both of the VA lists are nulled out and we have printed those values and everything is great. So uh, let me just quickly show how that works because it's it uses type IDs in a fairly neat way. So uh, first off, um, here, um, and I probably don't even need to use macros for these. I could have made functions on the C side, but I just made them macros because they don't have any multiple evaluation issues. Um, or maybe, you know, I think they probably would need to be. But anyway, um, so we have these things that are kind of the counterparts of, of uh, those symbols in, in our version of Studark. And then we have this thing here, which, which is the more interesting one. Um, that takes this any argument. And then the way it works is internally, it does a type ID kind dispatch and uh, calls VA arg hard coded for all the different sizes. Um, and you know, if it, if it can't match any of the, if there's some unknown kind, then it says, sorry, not supported. Like it, right now it wouldn't support structs or something, some other variable sized data like that. You have to use the built-in types, um, th these primitive types. Um, one interesting note is that it takes into account the default argument promotions. So if you do, if you pass in a bool or a char, some, some, something that's not an int, basically, uh, we know that when these, if a bool or a char was originally passed uh, to a function, a variadic function, they're going to go through the default argument promotion. So both of them would get promoted to ints. And so it's important that when we do var to pull them out from the uh, variable argument list, that we have to pull them out as ints because they've been promoted. Um, and so that's why you'll see, even though the left-hand side here is doing an assignment to a bool because that's what any is, that's what the underlying any storage is. Um, when we're pulling them from the uh, from the variadic argument list, we have to take into account the default argument promotions, which is why we have int here, even though the uh, the, tar the target type is different. Uh, and then for these bigger things that don't get promoted, they are just sort of themselves. But you can see here for float, for example, uh, again, we take into account the default argument promotions where uh, floats are passed as promoted to doubles when they're passed to a variadic function. Um, and so that's how that stuff works. Um, the thing that I think is not standard compliant at all, but seems to work on the compilers, is this. VA start, the second argument of VA start is supposed to be the name of an argument. But here I'm taking, like, I'm, pa I'm taking a pointer and then dereferencing it. Uh, and so we're getting back some kind of L value that corresponds to that argument, but it's not just the name of an argument or whatever. Um, this gives a warning on playing, not on GCC, on Linux, but it seems to work on both compilers, like I've tested the code, uh, works correctly. So um, definitely um, a little bit dubious, uh, but seems to work. And uh, I think importantly lets us uh, do standard arc stuff without putting in uh, special compiler tricks. Uh, just to support it. So that's pretty neat. And again, we'll do a more type safe version of this whole thing later, but even that type safe version will probably piggyback on top of the uh, VA arc putter because uh, you, if you want to use the C calling conventions rather than an explicit array, you would end up doing something like this anyway. Um, anyway so I don't know if, you know, you could also have your own calling conventions for variadic functions where you pass a pointer to, you know, like you have a length of a thing and then you have a pointer to the base of an array with temporary storage that it will go and read and then whatever. So let's see how we do our own style of args that are more type safe. But uh, anyway, for now, this definitely helps us with interoperability, which was the main goal. All right. Um, I think that's what I wanted to cover. Let me just see here. Yep. I think that's what I wanted to cover for the review. Let me quickly look at stream chat and then we will jump into RISC-V toolchain. All right.
righty. Um, uh, Sean was asking if you have, so this is referring back to the uh, suffix uh, target filtering for, for files. If you have uh, foo.ion and foo underscore linux.ion, does it compile both on Linux or only the most specific? Um, right now, if there's no suffix that's like that, that relates to uh, architecture or whatever, it will compile always. So if I had, for example, here a file called um, config.ion, that would always be compiled. Um, so you can see an example here. I have types.ion. This thing is universal. Uh, and it's not universal according to the C standard, um, but it's universal according to the assumptions I'm making in the compiler right now. Um, so you can see this is this is always conditionally compiled in regardless of target. Um, and so, for example, you know, here I'm saying here are all the basic types that I expect to have invariant size, have invariant size. Uh, all these things are naturally aligned. That's what this static assert is saying. And then I have, again, based on these static asserts of the expected sizes, I set up type defs. And these type defs under the hood will actually compile to something that isn't making assumptions about what those standard C types have size, have it have a size. But um, so yeah, this is the kind of thing you can do. So this is where I define, this is a good example, by the way, of something where I used to have all this hard coded symbol table, you know, add to symbol table stuff in the C code and all this is now here. So this is the generic stuff for all platforms that both does, you know, defining new symbols and also asserting that things are as expected. And then for specific platforms, I will define more specific things like WCHAR, uh, or in this case, asserting that uh, all these different ABI types um, that I know differ, uh, differ in the right way. Um, so yeah, uh, I think you had a second part of the question uh, where Sean's saying, we found it useful in CDEP. So CDEP is a, uh, a build tool that Red Game Tools uses internally, which I have not so fond memory, memories of, but a lot of experience with, unfortunately. Uh, and CDEP have the ability to have a common file, for example, for all POSIX uh, systems and then overwrite them only for some architectures. But I don't think you have that ability with your exclude system, which will use all files that match. So you can't have a fallback. Um, regarding um yeah i i haven't so i've thought about it um so I, i'll mention what go does go actually has a convention for uh, build filtering where i think the first line of a file if you have a comment that starts with a certain thing like this um, you can specify a more complex boolean directive um, and i think the system under the hood is actually what drives the convention over configuration suffix based stuff so this this suffix based stuff is essentially a shorthand for that notation um, and so it's possible we will add something like that later to handle um, to handle that. Now, the thing you mentioned with having something generic for POSIX and then maybe for specifically for Linux overwriting it, um, you could add custom, like, and when I mean custom, I mean like in the compiler, you, you could add specific rules about that. Like right now it's not supported, but I would not be averse to doing that. I've thought about the POSIX thing specifically already because there's a lot of stuff you'd want to be invariant across OS X. And, um, and Linux, although what you can do is you can have, for example, um, I don't know, you could have type underscore POSIX. Um, no, I guess you couldn't, uh, sorry. Yeah, anyway, we can add that stuff if it, if it seems to be useful or necessary enough to add. But uh, right now this is, uh, covers a lot of basic stuff uh, conveniently without a lot of complexity in the filtering. So may, may, maybe expand it later, but for now this is a pretty good start. All right. Um, I guess the other thing to mention is that um, this goes ways back, but if you want to exclude files entirely um, from the build, uh, like let me give an example here. S -s Suppose I have um, like a static azure zero, so this is always going to trigger. Um, uh, if I have this kind of thing here and we uh, compile, oops. Um, let's see we should get a static assert. So yeah, we get a static assert for this. If you want to exclude this like temporarily because you're working on it and you don't want, you know, you don't want it to uh, intrude or something, you have two options. The one that is maybe most cross-platform is to use underscore. Um, so and actually I haven't tested this, so I really hope it works. Okay, I, I never actually tested it even though I coded it. Uh, but uh, if you use an underscore prefix, it will get excluded. This is the same as Go. Uh, you can also use a dot, which is maybe more Unix-ish. 
like where dot prefix dot files are hidden. Um, but you know some operating systems may have issues with that uh, or whatever. Um, so this should also work. Uh, and then if we rename it back to just temp.ion. Uh, oh wait, that, did I? Well, I should probably still leave it there. That wasn't the real test. Hang on. But yeah, this this should also not trigger the static assert. Um, but then if I rename it back to just plain temp, we should get get it back. Yep. So. Um, that's something you can use if you want to have a bunch of code in a directory um, that, that is temporarily removed because you're kind of working on it and you don't want it to screw up the build in the interim. Um, let's see here. Um, what about static constant booleans that cause conditional compilation? Um, a la Java, which doesn't compile bytecode for conditionals that are always false. Um, yeah, I mean, like, the, the the thing that I suspect will be added eventually is a way to do stuff that only compiles in in debug builds or whatever, right? Um, I think in general, compiling stuff in and debug builds is a little bit problematic in terms of, um, like, I, what, what I'm thinking for that is as much as possible, you want, like, for example, for debug only stuff, I think you want the symbols and the signatures to always be the same. So you don't want those to be treated differently between uh, release and, and debug builds. Um, but then maybe what you can do is you can mark declarations as being, like, use this declaration in this build or this implementation in this build or not. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be kind of a conditional compilation thing in a low level sense, but it would be more on the back end or something where things are distinguished. So I haven't thought about how I want to do that. Um, but I think if we do build directives in the Go style, you would be able to do it that way, you know, where you can say like, you know, plus tag or whatever, like, you know, plus debug or something. I don't know. I don't, I can't, I don't know what the Go notation is offhand, but like if we support this to do more general uh, file level filtering, you would be able to do something like that. But um, I, w I still want it to be file level. Um, and I don't want it to be driven by constants that are defined by the program because, because then the resolution order becomes indeterminate unless you do something very crazy. I want basically the parser to be able to make the distinction. I don't want to have to get the resolver involved in order to filter stuff. Um, so anyway, um, th that stuff is, is not final, but I think this is a good subset to start with. Um, but yeah, they would, so they wouldn't really be like constant booleans per se. They would just be like build flags maybe, right? But they would not be part of the type system. They wouldn't be like consts in our sense, because that means that now even deciding whether to handle a file is entangled with the resolver, which is a, a bad separation. Um, so I don't want to do that. All right, let's, uh, let's go into the next thing. But anyway, uh, this is starting to feel like a real, a real thing, which is awesome. Uh, which also makes me happy to go into actually writing a bunch of tools in it uh, because it now feels really good to work on, especially with all this crazy Visual Studio integration that just fell into our lap. All right, um, Risk Five stuff. I hope some of you at least had an opportunity to look at the instruction set manual, uh, even if only casually. Um, Last time in an extremely sleep deprived state, I rambled in no particular order through various things. Um, I'm, I'm still not going to do a extremely regimented uh, presentation of this stuff. I think the better way to do it is just to jump into it and talk as we go because that's the easiest way for me and hopefully it's useful for other people. Um, so the plan for today is to basically begin working on initial set of tools for doing risk 5 stuff and so it will be some intertangle you know entwined combination of assembler disassembler simulator and debugger and i mention all of those things because the way i plan on implementing them they will use a lot of common infrastructure for example i plan to have the instruction encoding and decoding for all of those tools basically use shared representations even though it might not be optimal for performance i think for a reference implementation that's a really clean way to express it um, and uh, optimization, you know, for example, if you want to have a more optimized uh, simulator that does a single branch in order to both do decoding and decide what 
instruction to handle. Um, we can do that later, but for now, I think um, trying to unify those tools as much as possible um, is is useful, especially for people who haven't seen how to write those tools before. They might think that all these tools are completely kind of separate things, uh, whereas really, for example, a disassembler needs to decode instructions, and so so does a a simulator, right? Um, and so trying to unify those representations uh, gives us a bunch of, of leverage, even though it does have some negative performance implications, which we can address later if we want to do a more optimal simulator. But so my plan for today is basically to start working on those tools. Um, and, um, and probably the best place to start is to start with the instruction decoder. Um, so, and let me just, uh, let me just make a new top level directory. That was not a directory. Um, and I will call it risk five. And, um, I'll just call it risk five ion for now. Um, and uh, let me uh, let me also set up some C equivalent over here. Got to love Visual Studio. It is the best. Uh, empty project risk five. Looks good. Um, set up a pre build step. Uh, command line. Uh, let's call it just risk five for now. And uh, I guess we need, I'm just going to add, add it to the ion path. Uh, Actually, let's yeah. Let me add the top level directory to the ion path, which is maybe not the cleanest thing in the world, but um, should work for this. And so let's see if that works. And that did not work. So these are just warnings. Not print the right thing. Um, let me just compile it from the command line. It should compile about what do you want to call it? Um, you know what? I should probably not make this top level like this. Um, You know what, let me, let me just move it into ION for now. Um, okay, yeah, so that works. I just needed to find an entry point. Let me just change the command line for this. Oh, that, that is right. Now if we run, we should just get a no entry point warning, which we don't. All right. Um, All right. Um, yeah. So let's let's define an entry point. Uh, okay, my file is gone. Yeah, that's really not working then. Because my command line there is just wrong. What is it really complaining about? Um, what do I use for these others? Okay. 
I guess it needs that. Fine. God. internal or external command. I think there's a file here, right? So why is that not working? CD projects ion bit by ion ion risk five. It should just work. This is always the fun of starting. That still doesn't work. Let's see. Um, boom, boom, boom. Sorry about this distraction, but I really don't understand why. C colon backslash projects ion. I have a command prompt. Very strange. This looks identical. Okay, at some point, I'm going to just move on to the other thing. The ion ion thing is just because it's not good about uh, displaying the line endings. That's not the issue, I think. Like if if you go here, uh, it's correct. It's just it doesn't have a way of visualizing the new lines. There must be something different about this project. Um. Oh, I know what it is. It probably needs to reference. I, I don't know if that's it, but maybe it needs to reference the compiler because the compiler is doing a clean and then the XE doesn't exist anymore. Oh God, that was it. Ugh. Yeah, so that's why it's. Let me let me just clarify why that is. It didn't have a reference to the Ion compiler project, so it didn't know that the thing it depends on is generated here. So it was trying. It probably does all the cleans of the XEs first. And then it was trying to reference the XE, which at this point didn't exist. Anyway, so. Oh. No, so yeah, no, it, it wasn't that. It was this. But, um. Yep, okay. Great way to start. Um. Let's also do. Actually, one thing I found out recently. Which you can't do from Visual Studio, but you could do it with the XML file, the MS build file. Um, if you look at 
I guess test project would be an example. Yeah, we can do this kind of thing. something like this. Um, and now we have this. So we don't have to do manual ads for these. The only downside is that when you use this approach of doing this recursive, um, sort of recursive wildcard include, um, first off, it has to reload this, it has to reload the solution of the project in order to pick up on changes. And it also doesn't seem to preserve the hierarchy. So if you have a bunch of files that are called foo.ion, under that hierarchy, they will be flattened out here, which, uh, but it's still better than nothing because it means that I can actually, uh, it's sort of under the purview of IntelliSense. All right. All righty, all righty. Um, so um, I'm just going to start having everything in one file and then we'll go from there. So let me just, uh, let me just talk through where you might want to start. Um, there's a bunch of different instruction classes, and um, the 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 base uh, the, the base ISA uh, in in classical RISC fashion uh, has 32-bit instructions uh, fixed length. Um, there's uh, there's actually uh, well currently in the in the so-called compressed extension um, there are 16-bit uh, instructions that um, essentially can express a subset of of instructions and a subset of registers from the normal ISA. So it's not really a new set of instructions, it's just a new encoding for certain instructions in the existing set. Um, but for the basic set we're covering today and, and for the you know for uh, for the foreseeable future or the short term future, uh, we'll just be working with the, the the base encoding which is 32 bits. So it's a um, it's a uh, fixed width encoding for for for, the, for this case. And so um, one of the basic problems you have with instruction encoding is uh, making enough room for everything. Um, and so I do want to talk a little bit about this sort of at a high level um, to give some context. So if you are an x86 programmer, you probably know that, if you know a little bit about the assembly side, just a little bit, uh, you know that there are certain instructions that can have immediate operands. And I think uh there's only two options for immediate operands there's 8-bit immediates and there's 32-bit immediates in x86 um and depending on the opcode you 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 know the processor decodes which of which of those cases is required and so the basic x86 encoding is you have a bunch of one byte prefixes um that are optional then you have uh, the the main opcode byte um which uh, can also depending on on which opcode it is can also have an extension and so on, but basically there's a base byte that is sort of the branching off point for, for further types of, of decoding. Um, and ultimately you decide, hey, this I, I know what instruction I'm dealing with, and I know that, for example, it has a 32-bit immediate operand. Now, because it's a variable length encoding where you kind of do things mostly one byte at a time and kind of branch off based on the, uh, the encoding in those bytes, um, it's pretty easy to have a full 32-bit immediate uh, supported in these encodings. So, for example, you can have a uh, a one byte opcode followed by as, assuming it's an opcode that signifies an instruction with a 32 bit immediate. Um, that can you can you can then say, oh, having read that first byte, I now know as uh, and me being the processor, for example, I now know that I am to expect a 32 bit immediate immediately following that one byte. And so I'm just going to read an extra 32 bits, you know, an extra four bytes after that one byte for the opcode. And that's going to be my immediate. And so you never have to, you're never really crunched for space in that kind of fractional sense where you have to fit everything in 32 bits. And as soon as you go over 32 bits, you have to go to 64 bits. With variable length encodings, you can have, you know, one byte for the opcode and four bytes for an optional immediate operand. And uh, in RISC, um, 
the traditional style of sort of risk uh, instruction format design, uh, you don't have that. Uh, you tend to ideally have everything in, in one instruction width. And then if you want to do things like a full 32-bit immediate combined with an opcode, you somehow have to split it across multiple instructions in a clever way, and hopefully in a way that's pretty efficient in terms of the execution performance. Um, so that's why here, let me just mention these instruction classes uh, and corresponding formats. You can see there's four types here. Um, and I want to focus both on what's common between them and what's different, sort of in view of some of the things I just mentioned. The first is that all of them start with, um, with not quite a, the full lower word, and I mean lower here in a little, uh, low in, a little Indian sense. Um, but you know, mostly, the, I think the, the lower seven bits are the opcode. And so all of these different classes have a common part, which you can think of as being a little bit like, you know, in x86, uh, you can have a one byte instruction and then branch off from there for your decoding. Well, here it's like, it's not a completely separate entity. It's part of the same word, but it's the same basic idea where before you know what you're dealing with, you need to go and look at something that's common to everything. So in that sense, it's kind of like a tagged union where the opcode tells you how to interpret the remainder of the data. Um, and in fact, um, I mentioned before that RISC-V supports, does support variable length encodings. Um, and the way those are detected is by the first couple of bits even. So there's, a, I think, uh, all the uh, RV32I instructions begin with a bit of, is it like, I can't remember, is it 110 or something like that? Like there's, I think, I think maybe the three lowest bit or the two lowest bits are always the same. And so uh, even beyond these four types, just even knowing that you're dealing with this general kind of, ins uh, of, of instruction set subset, um, you can determine that by looking at a fixed set of bits in, in those lower seven bits. So that's kind of why you have these common bits. And then there's stuff you can see that's common as well. So for example, the registers are always in fixed positions regardless of, um, of the instruction class. Now, some of them don't have register operands or don't have the same register operands. So for example, um, this R type is a general register register operand. So this is a three operand instruction like you're adding two registers and putting the result into a third register. So in this case, RS1 is the first operand and RS2 is the second operand and RD is the destination register. Um, and there are 30, 32 registers on, on risk five. Uh, so you need five bits to specify each of these. Uh, register zero is kind of a sentinel value that's reserved to mean a zero register. So you can use that as basically an immediate operand um, without having to use an immediate type instruction. Uh, and so if you specify, uh, it's called X0, although maybe I'll call it R0 sometimes if I mess up because I'm so used to referring to R0 and so on rather than X0. But X0, if you specify that as a register operand, it means the zero value, the immediate zero essentially. Um, if you specify three, it means you know register index three in the register file. Um, and for the destination register, the way that's interpreted is that if you write to X0, it's essentially just throwing away the result. It's not doing anything with the result. Um, so that's like dev null almost. Um, but you can see that all of these fields are in fixed positions where they are used. Now, the reason for that, and, and I will explain more of this when we get to the hardware, but one of the reasons for this is that um, hardware is fundamentally parallel and by setting things up this way, you can essentially start fetching register operands before you know what instruction you're dealing with. So you can start, you can basically hook up the read ports um, to these uh, to these seven bit fields of these instructions, even before you know what you're dealing with. And then it may turn out after you fully decoded things, it may turn out that actually uh, in this instruction here in the I type, actually R R RS2 is not needed. So even though you kind of fetched it, and I'm talking in software terms in terms of starting the fetch, waiting some time and looking at whether we need it or not. In hardware, this is really done combinationally for the most part, rather than serially, uh, sort of step by step. But I'm talking in software terms, hopefully to be more accessible. But for hardware people listening, I, I'm kind of using a mental model that's maybe not quite accurate to how hardware works. But it, I think it's a useful way to think about it. You know, Starting the fetches early, and then once we've decoded the instruction, maybe we know that actually for, I, for I-type instructions, RS2, we fetched it speculatively, but we actually don't need it. And so we're just not going to use it. Um, but by fetching it, but by having it in a fixed position, we can fetch it. And so in some cases, you know, for example, for an I-type instruction, uh, RS2 would actually be driven by essentially the lowest seven bits of this 12-bit immediate operand, 
which would not which would be garbage like that instru that that register would not mean anything useful but the point is it's not a side effect we can just choose to ignore the result if we turn out to have an i type instruction so that's kind of the logic by, by why these fields are in in in, um, in these positions um so what else is there well you can see first off um we have the base opcode here then we have these uh, so-called function fields the function fields are opcode extensions. So again, this is something you have in x86, but in x86, it's done with extension bytes. So for example, a lot of x86 opcodes uh, are followed by what's called a mod RM byte. So you have the opcode byte, and most instructions are followed by a so-called mod RM byte, which typically has two three-bit fields and one two-bit field. So the two-bit field is like address, I guess it's the, mod, the mode, the addressing mode, and then the two other things are specifying like potentially a register, uh, or sometimes one of the three-bit fields is also called the X field. It's like a three-bit extension to the eight, to the eight-bit opcode from the base opcode byte. Uh, here you have something similar. Uh, you have a three-bit extension to the base opcode, but again, this is a fixed-length encoding in the RISC style, not a x86 style variable you know, byte byte-oriented variable-length encoding. But it's kind of the same idea in, in a sense, in that you're trying to get a bigger set of, of functionality, um, and um, and so that's kind of the idea. So, for example, the opcode here uh, in Risk Five, once you decode those seven bits, the opcode might say this is an ALU type operation, um, but at that point you don't know whether it's an add or a subtract or whatever. Um, you just know that it's a register type thing, so it has two register uh, source operands. And it's a general ALU class operation, but then you have to go and uh, look in more detail. And actually, I guess in this case, it would be even more like maybe you even have to. I can't remember the encoding off the top of my head. I have to look at it in a sec. But I think actually, func three would generate would specify the general ALU class, and you still have to then go and look at the upper seven bits to decide whether it's an add or a sub, for example. But that's the general idea. It's this kind of hierarchical decoding where this thing tells you. The class, and then from there you have to go and do this kind of, you know, cascaded decoding to, to decide what operation is actually happening. Um, so, uh, so, so with all this out of the way, let me account for why the function field is split into multiple parts. So you might say here, well, so if you add up these fields, you can see you have seven seven of these upcode bits, three function bits here, and then another seven function bits here. Why didn't why don't you just have eleven function bits? Um, so maybe I'll pretend this is like a class and I'm asking questions to the class. But d does anyone know or can anyone guess why? Uh, with and you, you should be able to deduce it from what I've already talked about. Why is um, why are these function bits split across multiple positions? Um, can anyone tell me that? And I guess Fabian and Sean are allowed to say, but if other people know, that would maybe be more. Oh, I don't know. It, it's not very deep, but it's something I just talked about in terms of the fact that the register operands are in fixed positions. Um, right. I mean, yeah. The the, the main idea, yeah. So, so Santos is saying it's to keep the uh, the register indices in the same spots. Um, Sean is asking a question that uh, I may not have the answer to offhand, but uh, the the basic idea is right: is that you're you're trying to 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 make sure that across these different classes, the register indices are in the same slots. Um, and so so Sean is saying he doesn't know why you couldn't swap function three and rd. Because then the immediate bits for this would be in a different position, I guess. But I don't know if that would actually matter much. I, I'm not sure offhand. I'm not going to pretend that I can uh, understand exactly that. Uh, but, um, but 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 anyway, the, the the broad idea is that you want these things to be in the same slot. So that so that's one thing to note. Um, let me mention another thing. Um, which is pretty subtle, and that's like a hardware thing, and I think they maybe specify it here. Um, 
All right. The, the, the first thing I'll, uh, so, so let me talk about the other trick, the, uh, the other encoding trick that's in the instruction set along the same line. So that one was pretty basic. Here's one that's a little more subtle and is a little more kind of tied to hardware design knowledge. Um, note that, so let's look at these different types of immediates first. You have a, uh, I guess this is a 12 bit immediate. Um, this notation is inclusive, by the way, so it's a little confusing. So this is 12 bits, even though it says 11, right? Because you can see this goes up to 31. So this means the 32nd bit index 31. Um, but uh, so you'll see this thing here has 12 bit immediate. I guess this is also 12 bit, um, but this is split across different positions. So maybe this is actually, maybe we'll be able to deduce the answer to Sean's question by analyzing those. Um, so, th so this is a 12-bit operand. This is a 12-bit immediate operand. Uh, this is a 20-bit, I guess, 20-bit operand. And incidentally, to anticipate something we'll talk about in a second, 12 plus 20 is 32, which is not an accident. Um, but um, one cool trick they have here is, first off, Note that all of these immediate operands are sign extended. Um, so these these are used. They they don't specify unsigned operands. They specify signed operands. So for example, minus one, right? Like just as the simplest example, minus one is encodable as an immediate, even in these short immediate forms where you only have twelve bits. Um, and so in order to get the sort of full full word width version of the immediate that you can actually do arithmetic on, you have to do sign extension. In the in the in the decoder typically probably like at some early point in the pipeline and uh, sign extension is essentially a matter of uh, for all the upper bits that are potentially unfilled by the direct bits from the instruction you have to sort of replicate the sign bit into that position now um, uh, one neat trick here is that um, and I think this is what answers Sean's question, is that they intentionally for these, so this thing doesn't need to get sign extended because the it's already maximum width. The only thing you need to do with this is, is, is it, it, this thing is conceptually uh, zero padded for the lower 12 bits, um, but, but the upper bits are fully specified. So this thing doesn't need to get sign extended, but for these two cases, they both need to get sign extended. Um, and, by keeping the sign bit in the same position of the word, which is the, the position 31, I mean the highest bit position of the instruction register, um, you can do basically kind of unconditional, like just like we could, you know, I was talking about starting the instruction fetch early based on the fact that the register indices are in fixed position. Here the sign bit is in a fixed position, so you can si start the sign extension early. And it turns out that sign extension and simple pipelines can be a bottleneck for this stuff apparently. Um, which maybe we'll verify. I actually have never verified that for myself, but um, I know that's the uh, the stated rationale. Um, and so if you want the sign bit to be up here, um, then it kind of means you want to make things discontinuous. Uh, because otherwise, you know, for example, if, if you want RS2 to be in this slot, then you can't have the lower bits of that 12-bit immediate operand be in that slot. And so you have to put them elsewhere. And so they have to be somewhere else. I guess that doesn't quite explain why you couldn't swap RD and func3 as long as you then move the lower bits of this immediate over there um, to Sean's question. So maybe that would be acceptable. But in any case, it at least explains for the I type and the S type why they split this uh, immediate field across two parts in order to um, make sure the uh, the sign bit of this 12-bit immediate that's used for sign extension is always in the same position so that you can start the sign extension before you know what instruction type you're dealing with. So you can start it before decoding has completed, basically. Um, I think that's what I wanted to say about decoding. This is totally ad lib unprepared stuff. So I'm just kind of telling you stuff that I know about the, or think I know about this stuff. Um, but if there's any mistakes or you have questions, uh, let me know. I'm definitely not an expert necessarily on this stuff, even though I have messed around with it before. Um, yeah, so Sean's dropping, or uh, Fabian's dropping some knowledge about the sign extension thing. Uh, and Sean's also saying that if you're using these instructions with uh, a 64-bit, uh, yeah, that's true. If you're using it on a 64-bit, with 64-bit registers, uh, this bit would actually need to get sign extended uh, into 64 bits. And so, yeah, that's true as well. So even, even though these 
you know, the, the, I, I said that the, the, the upper bits are already filled in in this case. That's actually only true for 32 bits uh, registers, not for 64 bit registers. So that's true. So that's uh, something I had missed. Um, oh, and uh, they say it right here, the stuff I was talking about. So, uh, and I was pretending I was going from memory when it's right in front of me. All right. Um, right, you can see they break down uh, two instruction classes further. Uh, and I think this is for branches, right? Let's see here, if I remember this. Oh yeah, I think the main thing here is that um, for branch offsets, if you require a uh, two byte alignment, um, then you don't have to store the lowest uh, bit, right? Because it's always an even offset. And so you can have that be implicit, which means that everything gets shifted, I guess. Um, so S, Let's see here. And you can see, by the way, the, these these guys have the same sign bit trick that we were talking about. Um, but now you can see this is 12. But the reason it's 12 is because it's been conceptually shifted, I guess. And then they steal an extra upper bit. This is clever. Forgotten about this. But uh, yeah, so they, the the fact that this least significant bit uh, is implicit now with uh, because of this alignment, uh, two byte alignment, they steal this bit, um, but they still keep the highest bit in this position. So the sign extension work, works correctly. So that's a neat trick. Um, and then J type. Let's see here. Um, dun, 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 dun. Right, so it's using the same width of field, but the interpretation is different. So in this case, it's the upper part. Like uh, th this instruction type for you is for, um, I guess the only instruction that uses it, actually there's two. There's load upper immediate and there's add upper immediate to program counter, L LUI and AUI PC. Um, but the same basic layout is used, but with a different interpretation of the bits for this. And I guess this would be like a 20 bit um, relative branch or something like that. Or, tw you know, for longer offsets. Um, anyway, this will make sense in the context of the specific instructions, maybe, but uh, just going a little bit over the encoding. Oh, yeah, and here they talk about sign extension being critical uh, performance wise. So, yeah, you, some of these footnotes are great. This is the kind of thing you normally don't see in instruction manuals and uh, if you want to get a, a little bit better handle on hardware stuff, this is a good way to, uh, to try to make sense of this stuff. All right. Um, so um, with with that preliminary stuff out of the way, let's look at some different instructions, and then we'll actually start coding. But I, I have to remind myself of this stuff as well, because I didn't, I mean, I just jumped in. haven't really prepared. Um, so let, let, let's, let's look at these different instructions. Um, I think the core set of instructions is like 40 to 50 instructions, so it's not super huge. And there's obviously a lot of family resemblances, like all the LU instructions break into a few different classes and so on. Um, let's see here. I mean, and here they talk about like why they don't have overflow support. Like MIPS, for example, I believe had overflow. Like if the signed instructions in MIPS were, did, did overflow checks, right, if I'm not mistaken. Some, some instructions does have that, um, I guess. So yeah, it's another another design rationale. Um, okay, let's see here. So these are, yeah, integer register immediate. So this is one of the cases we talked about before. You only have one source register, but then the, the other operand is uh, from an immediate, a 12-bit immediate. Uh, and so these instructions are, there's add immediate, uh, set if less than, so this is, doing a comparison of a register value against the immediate value, interpreting it either as a signed or an unsigned quantity, and then setting uh, the result register to either one or zero, depending on it. So this is like, what is it called in x86? Set EQ or, or set, uh, set LT or whatever. Is, is that what it's, God, I really, yeah, I think that's what it's called. 
uh, anyway, so this is like a, a conditional creating a zero or one value based on a comparison of some sort. Uh, and or XOR, I think these are self-explanatory if you're a C programmer, but now you know one is a register, the other is immediate. Um, and you can see they say, you know, things are sign extended, etc. Um, so here we have some shift instructions, and as usual, there's three types. Um, there's only one kind of left shift, regardless of whether you're dealing with things that you think of as signed or unsigned. But there's two kinds of right shifts. There's a plane and there's an arithmetic shift. Uh, the arithmetic shift uh, smears the sign bit uh, across the bits that are shifted in. And what this means is if you are doing division by two or another power of two uh, of a negative number, this will, with appropriate caveats about whether it does the right thing for truncation or whatever, uh, th this will preserve signedness, basically for uh, when you're dividing um, when you're dividing negative two's complement numbers by two or powers of two. The, the, the thing I should mention that's a caveat about that is if you take minus one and you right shift it, uh, you get minus one because minus one two's complement is all ones. So when you shift it right, you shift in another one from the left because it's a, a arithmetic sh right shift. And so, uh, Minus one is a fixed point, which is probably not what you want, uh, and so you need to do some. I think you need to do some biasing in order to have proper truncating division by two or the power of two behavior. Um, but anyway, but that's the that's the arithmetic redshift. I only mention that because if you're a C programmer, you might not be used to thinking about this. One of the annoying things in C is that um, it is unspecified by the standard. What happens is no, it's is it implementation defined or is it? Sorry, we're supposed to be semi-experts by now on the standard, so we can at least go and quickly look at it. Um, even though this is a digression, I think it's something people need to know uh, or should know. Um, boom, boom, boom. If the value of the left operand... Right, so you can see that for negative values of the thing you're shifting, uh, which is where, you know, arithmetic right shift doesn't have a difference from a logical right shift if the operand is positive or non-negative rather. Um, and so what they're basically saying is right shift behaves like it's only truly defined uh, in terms of specific behavior for the case where uh, it's either unsigned or it's signed and non-negative. Um, a lot of implementations, though, uh, if you have a signed int and you do, I mean, we can maybe check this. Uh, I actually, don't, I don't normally rely on this, so uh, to be quite honest, uh, I'm not 100% sure what we'll get, um, but let's try it anyway. Okay, let's save it to the startup project. Oh, it must not have recompiled it. That's the only thing I can make sense of. Okay, it is still not recompiling it. Um, let me find out why it is still not recompiling it. Oh, it's because I am a moron. Okay, yeah, so it is doing an arithmetic redshift. So you can see, uh, even though this is implementation defined, um, it's doing an arithmetic redshift. And you can see, like I said, minus one. Well, I, I guess I don't know if it's reflected in the 
in the register mapping. But um, anyway, you can see what I said. If you have something like, I don't know, it's not recompiling. I need to set up my uh, Visual Studio stuff better. So you can see um, this works correctly here, but there's this issue if you want to use it for division by two where it saturates with minus one, which is not what anyone expects. Like normally, oh, it still hasn't recompiled. Oh man, I need to set up the dependencies correctly. Um, the, uh, yeah, so anyway, so that's an arithmetic redshift. In case you didn't know, it's not standards guaranteed, but I think most compilers, you can actually depend on it being arithmetic redshift if you have a signed operand. Uh, if this was unsigned, uh, like, you know, if, if you have 8, 2, or something like that, um, you should see... Oh, God, this is going to get bothersome. Um, you know, this should be a... So, so this was not a SAR, this was not an SAR, this is a logical right shift. So anyway, that's the sort of thing. And uh, you can kind of maybe depend on it and see if you know your compiler. But anyway, um, that was a digression, but I just wanted to mention it if people haven't seen that instruction before. Um, but that's what that is. And this is the immediate variation of it. Um, You can see in this instruction format in general, it gives the recipe for how to decode it. Um, so, you know, you can see the field series, this is how wide it is. So five bits for this and three for this and so on. Op M, this is a constant that corresponds to this subclass or whatever of instructions. So this tells you that it has an immediate operand. And then the func three tells you what type of shift it is. Um, and, um, and you can see that the encoding here is a little bit tricky in terms of how that works. Um, shouldn't this be func 7? Or are they just cannibalizing? Oh, I see. So they're not treating this as being one of the things that has func 7. Um, but yeah, basically, it's kind of like the func 7 uh, type in the sense that the 7 bits are used up here for uh, specifying some extra info, and then the shift amount is here. The shift amount is 5 bits because it's 32 bits, right? It's 2 to the 5 is 32. Um, what else is here? I'm going to go through the instructions like this first before we start implementing them because there's going to be stuff that's unfamiliar to people, even if you've done any I said 6. Like this stuff here, for example, I mentioned briefly before, this is the U format instructions. Like why are these needed and what, what role, do, how do they fit in with the other stuff? So I'm going to go through them like this, and then we'll go and implement things. Um, all right. Um, this is, yeah, so let's talk about this. I mentioned before that on, a, um, on an x86 processor uh, or other processors that have these kind of variable length encodings, you don't have this kind of quantization to 32 bits or some other fairly big qua uh, quantity for your instruction format. So you can have a one bit thing that leads things off and then you can have a 32 bit thing which totally misaligns the instructions and so on and it requires fancier decoding. Um, in um, If you're working with these 32 bit instruction words then it's sort of like if you can't fit something in 32 bits your only choice is two 32 bit quantities. Now you double your size to express the same thing. Um, and so uh, you might wonder, how do you handle immediates in general? Like meaning general purpose immediates. And so the answer, so, so let me take a concrete example. Let's take add i. Suppose I want to, um, suppose I want to do add i of um, x1, x2 plus um, something like this. So, uh, destination on the left, like uh, God intended. Uh, register operand here. So put the result in x1, read uh, the register operand from x2, and then here is an immediate operand. Now, 
this immediate operand requires full 32 bits. Um, so there is actually no way, if you look at this instruction format, um, there's no way to encode it directly because there's only uh, there's only 12 bits. So how do you get around this? Well, the first answer is, well, um, a lot of immediates are actually pretty small. Like they can be expressed in, um, in say, 12 bits. Uh, and so if you have an immediate that's actually small enough to be to fit, then you're 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 home scot free. Like you're uh, you can fit everything in that one instruction. And in particular, because things are sign extended, if you want to do something like minus one or uh, let's see, with 12 bits, I guess we can go up to like something like this. So this would maybe be the the the, the biggest the greatest magnitude thing you can express uh, as a 12 bit immediate. Um, and so you can do stuff like this, and this still fits. Or you, and I guess you could do up to something like that uh, on the positive side. Um, but in order to go beyond that, you no longer can fit in this word. So what do you do? Well, um, this is where having, um, so this is 12-bit immediate. Um, this is where having uh, this instruction, if we go all the way back to here, this is where having a instruction class that contains a 20-bit immediate is really great because 12 plus 20 is 32. And so between two of these instructions, you can express an arbitrary set of 32 bits. And so um, this brings us to the LUI instruction. And AUIPC is sort of the same idea, but for uh, instruction pointer offsets. Um, but let's start with LUI. Um, suppose I want to do the moral equivalent, and usually assemblers will let you do this, where you can you can type in what uh, what looks like you're directly adding, you say, a 32-bit immediate um, to a register. But in reality, this cannot be synthesized to a single instruction. So this is really kind of a pseudo instruction in the case where it can't fit. So how would you map that? Well. Um, Basically, what you can do is the following. You first do a load upper immediate to a temp register. Um, and actually, not a temp register, because we know it's, the result is eventually going into. Uh, actually, can we, can we do that in this case? Um, so I'll use this, which is, I think, the, ga the, the gas notation. Um, what you do is you use LUI first, I guess not maybe first, um, uh, let's see, let me think about whether that works or whether there's issues with carries. Um, in the specific combination. No, I think that works. Um, so basically what this does is load 10 upper uh, bits of xi with 20 bit immediate, set lower 12 bits to zero. Um, add lower 12 bits of immediate to x1, something like this. Um, maybe I, maybe there's an issue with carries, but I think something like this should work. But basically the idea is you, you, you do a pure immediate load, but really all you're doing is filling in those things. You're not really doing an, an, another operation on them at the same time. Um, and then you you do whatever instruction you're trying to do, uh, kind of putting in the 12-bit uh, immediate uh, at the same time. And so as a result, um, yeah, so, yeah. so I think there's a thing with the carries. Um, let's see if I got, I don't want to write anything wrong on stream. Yeah, the low-high stuff needs to account for the signedness. Um, 
Let's see, if the low bits end up with the top bit, you need to increment high by one, yeah. So the, the, let's not dwell, like let me not dwell on that for the second. Um, but anyway, the, 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 if you think of it just in terms of a data encoding format, um, this is basically the idea is that there's there's one instruction that, um, I guess a better example maybe would be if you wanted to, yeah, but anyway, this is the broad idea. Um, and if you if you wanted to, you could also just do this. So so, so actually, let me give you the proof. I guess the fa the fairly full foolproof formula, which is um, LUI actually doesn't set the lower bits to zero, does it? No, it does. Okay, I, I was going to say that it preserves them because then you could do it in the other order. Um, have I been live for this long? Yeah, so there's, okay, I have to think about this. This is embarrassing. I didn't have that prepared. But anyway, the basic idea is you can you can load uh, the upper 12 bits uh, in one instruction, and then you can kind of fold in the, the lower 12 bits in another instruction. And uh, Sean and Fabian pointed out that we need to take into account the sign extension in this case so that um, it doesn't uh, propagate up. Um, so there has to be a fix up apparently. Like I, I thought there was a way around that, but anyway. But uh, let's not get into the weeds of that for now. Um, but that's the basic idea of why this instruction format exists the way it does. It's because 12 plus 20 is 32. You can express a full 32-bit uh, immediate in two instructions, and the second instruction is hopefully doing something useful. It's not just um, the second instruction is not just loading. It's also doing an arithmetic instruction that you're maybe trying to do. Uh, and that may not always be possible to fold them like that, but in many cases it can be. And so um, you're not just doing two instructions to set up the immediate into a register and then doing the arithmetic op. Uh, sometimes you can fold them in like that, depending on the immediate, I guess, uh, because of the sign extension issues. Um, anyway, yeah, AUIPC is sort of a similar idea where um, when you're trying to, you, yeah, you can see here, when you're trying to, um, do long offsets, um, you know, like branch offsets uh, and, and jumps and so on, have a limited range because of uh, for, for these immediate branch offsets, uh, which I guess is it's 12 bits, but I guess it's actually 13 in terms of the reachable range because it uh, assumes two byte alignment, so there's an implicit zero bit at the bottom. Um, but that still gives you only, I guess, it gives you a limited range you can jump from the current instruction. And so AUIPC is for really doing arbitrary 32-bit offsets from the um, from the program counter. So uh, this is, by the way, I should mention this is not directly side affecting the program counter. This is just building in a register. It's reading um, it's reading the program counter as a you know as a register. Um, it's doing arithmetic on it, grabbing those upper immediate bits and putting that in a register. And then you can fill in the lower bits afterward. Uh, and then you can do an indirect jump through that register in order to do an arbitrary displacement. I think, yeah, that's the idea. Um, all right, so what did we cover here? We covered some register immediate operations and some of this upper lower immediate stuff. Uh, the register register operations are obviously quite a bit simpler. Um, you know, these work much like you would expect if you were just, you know, if you're a C programmer and you're doing arithmetic directly on variables, it's quite a bit, I mean, it's conceptually very similar. Um, uh, we have these different conditional instructions for generating zeros or one, depending on the outcome of a signed or an unsigned comparison. You also note that there is no, um, there is no, um, there's no greater than whatever, like you can, um, you know, to get greater than, you can flip the operand order. Um, so if you want to have a pseudo instruction that flips it for you, you can do that. But the uh, instruction set itself doesn't define that. And I get for set if, for doing set if equal or something like that, um, you um, you could do. I guess what's the instruction I'm thinking of? I mean, you can do some kind of. Uh, uh, what, what what's the instruction I'm thinking of? You could do some kind of like. XOR of two things in a non-zero check, uh, like set 
what am I thinking of that instructions called? Anyway, so so that's it for that. Uh, then there's uh, there's control flow for changing where the program counter is. Uh, this is where the instruction encoding is potentially a little bit complex um, to deal with the different possibilities and trying to be fairly optimal on what you can do. Um, so you can see there's the jump and link instruction, um, which is, um, let's see here, you boom, boom, boom. you have a, a program counter relative offset, which is you know sine extended because it can be positive or negative depending on whether you're doing forward or backward jumps. You can see plus minus one megabyte, um, and um, yeah, the 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 jump and link part like jump is probably self-explanatory. This means go you know change the program counter to a new location to jump around in the execution flow. Link means that you're kind of storing off the uh, the instruction after the, the current instruction, you know, like, so you're jumping somewhere else and you want to find where the next instruction is so that if you're doing a function call or whatever and want to return, uh, you can come back to where you were. And so this instruction basically just stores the, uh, the sequentially next instruction address into the RD register. But note that um, you can ignore this by just putting it into X0, right, which is just a way of ignoring values. Um, um, and they, they, you, can, you can see here they mentioned that uh, unconditional jumps are actually done with a jump and link with an X0 uh, register. So rather than having a dedicated unconditional jump instruction, they just use jump and link. Jump and link is an unconditional jump, right? But it does more than just jump. It also puts the next instruction into a designated register, but you can just uh, throw that away if you don't want it. Um, there's an indirect jump which is the same thing, but now um, basically um, you're fetching the address you want to jump to from a register with an offset on top of that. Um, let's see here. So this is like an indirect kind of thing. But, but same idea as before in that um, you know, it will store off the sequentially next instruction address to a designated register. Um, and you can see that they, they use PC relative addressing for all of this stuff so that um, as you slide code around, you don't have to fix up the branch targets. Um, it's position independent in that sense. Um, let's see here. Right, so the way JLR works, you can see you can do uh, jump anywhere in the absolute address space. Uh, first load the upper bits with the target address, and then right, do a JLR which adds the thing. Right. So this is the same kind of 12 plus 12 plus uh, 20 approach to generating arbitrary immediates basically but now in the context of relative relative offsets for control flow yeah and, and the immediates here are not assumed to be two byte aligned uh, which even though they the instructions are required to be two byte aligned apparently they just didn't want to have yet a memo encoding okay um See here. This is, I guess, more microarchitecture level hinting, which is not necessarily part of the behavior. But basically, what this is saying is so, one thing I should mention is to link up with something like x86. x86 has call and return instructions um, when you're doing function calls. And in the, in the risk world, people typically don't have call and return. Instead, what they have is they have jump and link. Um, and similar kinds of things. And so in um, on a risk processor, typically, and RISC-V in particular, if you want to call a function, um, you don't have a call instruction directly. What you have is you have a jump and link instruction. And so if you're doing a direct, a direct function call, meaning you're not calling through a function pointer or something like that, you're just jumping to a known, known location, um, you specify the offset from your current address to that location, 
uh, and that's your immediate uh, operand to GAL. And, um, and then basically what happens is the quote unquote return address is put in the destination register that you specify. And so unlike something like call in the x86 world, which implicitly pushes stuff on the stack and hence implicitly does a store, um, JAL puts it in a register. And if you then want to put it on a stack, you have to do it yourself. So if, uh, if the, if the you know, stack frame layout for your ABI requires it to be in a certain position, uh, it's the caller, the callee's responsibility to put the, well, I guess, yeah, it, this would mostly be an issue if you want to do backtraces. The, the function locally itself could in theory decide to put that register anywhere it wanted. The main thing it's responsible for is eventually returning to where it came from, however it needs to do that. And in particular, one optimization you can do that is not really easy to do with the call, x86 call style uh, instruction is if you have a leaf function that doesn't actually need to store off the program counter anywhere, uh, the return address anywhere, uh, it can just keep it in the in the register until it returns, for example, or put it into another register. You know, we do whatever, but it doesn't need to ever traffic through memory for a leaf function if it doesn't if you don't want it to or you don't need it to. Um, but uh, one downside of of using this kind of uh, I, I guess like this more general general style of control flow that doesn't specifically say this is a call, this is a return, is that you're kind of using um, you're using general control flow instructions for both the call and the return. They're not they're not distinguished by their basic instruction type or opcode. Um, and so here they're basically saying that um, you're supposed to, based on a certain pattern of usage of these instructions, uh, if you're implementing return address stack uh, support in your processor, which is a common branch prediction optimization where um, aside from potentially having, I mean, in, in the case of x86, you have a real call stack in memory somewhere probably that's, you know, the return addresses are intermingled with other stuff, but it's there in memory somewhere. Um, in addition, the processor has a model of at least the part of the return address chain so that when you eventually do a return, um, it can it can predict where the return address is going to be and it can start uh, speculatively executing that. Um, and so this is a form of branch prediction, which is highly reliable. It's not really speculative as much as normal branch prediction is. Um, and this is very common. And here they're basically saying, if you see this pattern of, of these uh, instructions, your return address stack branch predictor should interpret it as follows. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the, the intention here. Um, but you don't necessarily have to understand this if you're just implementing the semantics of the instructions. This is an optimization for chip designers and also to get people to standardize on the convention so that code benefits from it consistently and also so that code generators generate the right instruction sequences so that uh, bench predictors don't get confused. Um, okay, so this was all basically unconditional control flow. Uh, here we cover conditional branches. These are pretty standard, I guess. Um, one thing that basically all modern ISAs do is that they have fused um, you know, in x86, you have separate compare and and jump, uh, you know, uh, instructions. So, I don't know. Like, if if I uh, if I do something like this, just to show what I have in mind, as a compare and contrast thing. If you do something like this. It first does a compare, so it's loading uh, the argc, it's comparing it to the immediate three, and um, the side effect of a compare instruction, and actually not just the dedicated compare instruction, but a bunch of our other arithmetic instructions, is to sit certain uh, condition flags that are in an implicit flag register, um, and then these different conditional instructions uh, are predicated on those flag bits. So this says jump if less than or equal, um, but uh, this thing here is implicitly coupled to here, even though there's no direct like register dependency. It's implicit through the flag register, those uh, predication bits that are in there. So this is how this is this is how most processors did things until RISC, I think. Um, I'm trying to remember if some really old processors also had combined compare and branch instructions, but nowadays most newer instructions that have um, have instructions that basically do the equivalent of, of these things in the same instruction. And also, even for x86, 
Um, at least I, 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 Fabian would know this if he's still in chat, but several microarchitectures ago, it became completely standard that uh, they do macro op fusion uh, in the front end, decoding front end, so that if you see a certain combination of a compare and jump instruction in the decoder even, so this is very early in the pipeline of a modern Intel processor, they will actually fuse it to a single micro op. So normally the way modern, and, and I guess I haven't explained all this stuff before, but like if you know a little bit about this, you know, the way modern Intel processors work and a lot of other sort of high-end cores is that they take these complex instructions and then they break them into micro instructions that can be scheduled independently and that are generally simpler to execute. Um, but this is a case where actually you take two macro instructions and you fuse them into one micro instruction, which has to happen sort of at the front end. Uh, I guess you could potentially do it later as well, but it's convenient to do it there. But it, as a practical matter, it also means that um, I think you have to be careful about scheduling these instructions, like in your co compiler's instruction generator. Like you don't want to try to move this instruction further back here, uh, and then and and then you're being clever. And it's like, oh, all the intervening instructions don't affect the flag bits, and so I can move the comp back. I think if you do that, you won't get macro up fusion. Um, but anyway, this is just to say that the idea of the, the fused compare and branch uh, is so strong that Intel processors are doing it manually in the, in the decoding front end. And most newer instruction sets do that fusion at the instruction set level rather than doing it as an internal implementation detail. So that was just a preliminary, but that's all to say that these are fused compare and branch instructions. So they do equality, inequality, signed, unsigned, less than, greater than comparisons, and uh, jump to a certain offset from the current program counter, again, using uh, immediate bits that are sourced from, from the instruction. Um, oh, right, and you can see here that, um, yeah, like they say, you, you don't have greater than, you can flip the operands, and similarly, greater than or equal, you can do less than or equal by flipping the operands. And uh, incidentally, you'll have noted that most of the instructions we were looking at uh, didn't have signed versus unsigned variants for uh, integer arithmetic. The, the case where you really need this is for doing comparisons, because if you interpret minus one as an unsigned operand, it's actually the maximum possible value, right? It's all ones. It's equivalent to, say, 2 to the 32 minus 1. It's the possible, largest possible 32-bit value, for example. Um, whereas if you interpret it as a, um, as a signed quantity, then minus 1 is less than 0, for example. But 0 is not less than 2 to the 32nd minus 1, right? So this is why you need a signed versus unsigned variants for this stuff, um, but not for most other things. Like addition, subtraction don't need to be uh, with two's complement, they don't need to be uh, distinguished, signed versus unsigned. Um, some architectures do distinguish them for the sake of doing signed overflow traps, um, but um, there's no such thing in RISC-V. Um, let's see here. Right, more, more design notes here. I guess they actually talk about some of the stuff I was talking about. So yeah, read this stuff if you want a much more erudite, erudite uh, explanation of this stuff here with the old style of implicit pred predication bits from comparisons uh, versus the fuse style. Uh, load and store instructions. I, 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 this has been mostly me talking. Um, rather than coding, which was totally not according to plan, but I think we actually need to cover this stuff. And so uh, I apologize, but I, in a sense, I don't, because I do think we need to talk about this. And then, uh, and I also feel pretty tired. So I don't think I'll do an extra stream today, but I'll try to finish up this stream and then we'll do, I'll do more preparation over the weekend. Then we'll do proper real coding, I guess, next time. Um, load and store instructions. I think this is the last thing we have to cover, except for the low level system instructions. Um, the distinguishing, I mentioned this last time, but one of the distinguishing features of RISC architectures is that the only instructions that do loads and stores are actually load and store instructions. Um, the older style of instruction set, including things that are not really that complex, you know, like the, the word uh, complex instruction set architectures is used a lot, but uh, there are things that are actually not that complex by almost any metric, which nevertheless have this style of, um, of non-load store architecture where most instructions, like for example, old 
you know, 60, uh, 6502, uh, C80, I guess, was, I mean, a lot of these instruction says they're honestly not that complicated by, by any definition. And, um, but one thing they do have is that the instructions tend to have the ability to read and write memory in a single instruction along with other operations. So you can, for example, you know, in 6502, you can directly increment, um, you can directly increment a memory location uh, in a single instruction. And so that's a full read modify write, which is reading a memory location, adding one to it, uh, writing it back in one instruction. Um, most CISCs actually um, can only do a read memory or write memory in a single instruction, I guess. Uh, but um, the, the point being, this used to be the way most things work. And it's often quite convenient from an instruction encoding compactness point of view, like those old 8-bit processors, for example, could be quite expressive in a single 8-bit <clears throat> instruction. Um, and also, of course, had variable length encodings to, to add on to kind of sidecar information for different addressing modes. But uh, in uh, going back, I think even to Cray, like uh, the Cray CDC 66000 computer and some other Cray computers from the time frame, I think had a low store architecture as well where only um, basically all the operations were operating either on immediates or registers uh, and the only things that 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 went out to memory were these dedicated low store instructions and so that's that's kind of the heritage of that is it goes way back um, but for a long time in the 70s and 80s um, and i mean even nowadays like x86 is not load store it's a read modify write architecture um, if you do you know if you do I don't know. If you do something like this, um, or I don't know, like this, you you can add one, and this will, um, you know, this will read the location in memory, add one to it, and write it back out to that location, stuff like that. I mean, maybe this instruction format isn't quite legal, but I don't think it is. But anyway, so this kind of read, modify, write style is very common in older architectures and is still there in x86. But RISC has load store style where um, if you want to do the equivalent of, of something like that, you would first do a load, you would load a word, um, and you would um, you would add one, and then you would um, uh, you would you would I guess well this would be LVI, but let, let's say we have the address in X2, and then you would store it back out. I mean, and, and uh, there's also an implicit uh, immediate offset which I'm just going to ignore. But anyway, in uh, when you want to do read, modify, write in a risk style load store architecture, this is how you do it. You have to do the load separately, then you do the operation purely on registers or immediates, and then you write out the result. Um, in read, modify, write architectures, this can be done in one instruction. Um, so this is one of the major differences between risk and CISC. And, and it was done even before risk was really a thing uh, and was considered, was, was recognized as a good idea by some people even back then, like in the 60s. But anyway, so uh, let's look at these instructions. You can see first of all, there's these two different classes of loads and stores. What they have in common is there's a destination register when you're doing a load. So, so this is where you want to put the value after it's been loaded. There's a width field, which uh, is a, it says whether you're loading like a 32-bit you know, word uh, or a half word, which is 16 bits, or a byte, which is 8 bits. And also for these subword quantities like half words and bytes, it says whether you want to do sign extension. So all in all, I guess there's one, two, three, four, five. So I guess there would be five different variants. Um, let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so there's five different variants, and those are encoded in this width field. Uh, then there is a base register. So this is reading the base address from a register, and then there's an offset, which is which is an immediate, which is added on top of that register. So this is useful for doing stuff like constant array addressing. So if you have a base address of a um, of an array or a struct, and you have a certain like, I mean, what's an example? Suppose you have like you have something like this, and uh, you have some pointer to uh, to an X. So imagine this is in a register, um, and suppose you want to do, you know, you want to load that thing. The way this would basically work is you would do, 
uh, load word. I'm going to say Y, but Y is really just a register. Let's just call it X1. Um, let's say uh, address in X1, put result in X1, or address in X2, put result in X2. Um, so suppose we have the base pointer in X2, uh, then you want to load a certain field. Now, the address of this Y field is not at X2, it's at X2 plus <clears throat> Here. So I'm using this notation in from C, but this is basically the idea. You want the byte offset of that field from the base pointer. So the base pointer is contained in this register, and then there's an immediate, which is known statically from the static types. <clears throat> and uh, you add that in order to get the field offset, and then having calculated the field offset, and this is done in a single instruction. Uh, this is done as part of the instruction, not as a separate arithmetic op. Um, it loads that and puts it in the destination register. Uh, and this also works for array indexing, right? Like if you have a static array or whatever, anytime you're doing a static offset from a known location, a known, known, something that's in the register, um, then you can use this thing and do everything in a single instruction. If you need to do stuff like dynamic array indexing, um, then it's slightly different. So for example, if you had an array of ints um, and you want to do um, you want to do something like this. Um, maybe I'll just make it a pointer to emphasize what's going on. If you want to do something like this, um, because I is dynamic, um, you can't do this. Uh, you can't do this uh, with a single instruction. But what you can do is, for example, um, let's see here. Um, um, I guess we have to take i, let's say this is an x1, uh, x1, x2, x3. Um, so say i starts by being an x2, uh, we have to multiply i by 4, which is equivalent to shifting um, left by 2. Um, and uh, then we can do a oh, and then I guess we have to add it actually. Um, so let's just clobber that address, something like this, and then x1. I think something along these lines. So this is just doing the address calculation manually. This is the sort of thing that if you're on x86, <clears throat> you could do this with an addressing mode like. Um, um, something like this, um, because on x86, so rex is the destination register, rbx is the base register, rcx is the index register, and this is an addressing mode that can multiply by either 1, 2, 4, or 8 um, as part of the address calculation, and this is a kind of a SISKY thing. So if you want to do things like this in uh, on a RISC with a list architecture, actually, I should mention that ARM has much more expressive addressing modes uh, for its load instructions. Um, so, that, so that's, I guess, one thing that's worth mentioning. Just because you have a load star architecture doesn't mean you can't have rich addressing modes. In fact, uh, ARM not only has rich addressing modes in the sense of doing these kind of calculations, but it even has stuff like post incrementing certain uh, index registers and stuff like that. Um, so that is one thing I guess that's worth emphasizing. In RISC-V, they have quite anemic they don't really have addressing modes, period. They just have this one, which is uh, base register address plus 12-bit immediate. That's the only thing. And you have to synthesize uh, other addressing modes out of that, basically. Uh, ARM has a plethora of addressing modes, which um, maybe I'll go more into that in the future. There are ways with macro op fusion you can try to synthesize similar kinds of things, but uh, and, and then maybe use uh, compressed instruction encodings in order to reclaim the instruction size compared to having dedicated fancier uh, addressing modes for loads. But at that point, it's like you're adding a bunch of complexity to simplify the instruction set a little bit. Not clear whether that's a win. I know that performance-oriented programmers uh, are skeptical of that side of, of RISC-V's design compared to ARM. But ARM in general is not especially minimalistic in general. So uh, if you want to be kind of blown away by... Um, by a plethora of addressing modes, go to the ARM V8, you know, AR64 
instruction manuals and look at what the addressing modes they have. They have all the post increment, pre decrement, like all kinds of crazy things, and they're very useful. But uh, RISC-V doesn't have that, uh, which I think is good if you want to understand things, but it does mean that uh, there's less things for you to understand in terms of the instruction set, but it does mean that you have to break things down yourself like this, and potentially there's some loss in efficiency on, uh, on some processors. But anyway. Uh, at least it's very basic. You can kind of understand everything that's going on by, by how the basic components behave. Um, let's see here, memory model. I don't think I want to talk about that, um, but there are some fence instructions um, in order to control memory ordering. There's a whole separate uh, so-called privilege specification that has very detailed memory model. Um, um, the stuff that's in the core instruction set is really just about basic fencing. So, for example, if uh, if you do uh, self-modifying code, which is required when you're loading, you know, like you're loading a library into memory or something, uh, you're supposed to do a fence I, for example, in order to flush any instruction caches. Uh, or in the case of maybe if you have dynamic code execution, like a, a JIT, uh, you could use a fence I in order to flush your JIT cache. Um, so that's the sort of thing that's practically useful. Um, if the full memory model is in a separate document, this is really just the, the bare bone things. Um, then there's some lower level stuff, which um, may not be worth getting into huge detail here. Uh, these are things that roughly correspond to something like the uh, so-called machine specific or model specific registers in x86. Um, these are kind of built-in registers that are for very low level, fairly low level stuff. Um, the things that are not so low level and, and the instructions that are, or the, um, the built-in control and status registers uh, that are actually mandated by the standard for this very small subset in RV32i uh, are just like basic timing things so that you can um, read instruction counter, uh, like cycle counter and time counter. Um, and, um, you know, in x86, there's kind of a, <laughs> as usual, there's a, a weird mix of things that are equivalent to CSRs. On the one hand, you have RDTSC, which uh, is for reading a timestamp counter. And so this is a dedicated instruction type. Um, the equivalent of this in RISC-V is to, I guess, read time uh, would be the one. And uh, and so there's a instruction class essentially for doing these sorts of things, for reading and writing these internal registers. Um, and so you, you can use it for things like RDTSC on x86, but it's also used for low level very low level things that are not generally visible to user code. But from a user code perspective, the case where you definitely would want to use it is for things like RDTSC equivalents. Um, and um, the thing to say about this is that, um, uh, interestingly, uh, I mean, you, I guess you can't really say load store architecture for control status registers, but you kind of can. Uh, but one thing you'll note is that rather than just having separated reads and writes, they actually have read modify write instructions like atomic read write. Um, and the reason for that is some of these registers are essentially concurrent. Um, if you think of a normal uh, general purpose register like X1, X2, X3, and so on, uh, from a low level machine perspective, those are essentially, you know, you're the, unless there's like firmware or operating system code that's mucking with them behind your back, they're essentially your resource to use. They are not going to just going to change uh, sort of concurrently. But a lot of these control and status registers are actually truly concurrent resources. Like there's concurrent readers and writers. So for example, with a cycle counter, the cycle counter is constantly incrementing. The, the number of instructions retired is constantly incrementing. And so because of this, um, there's no way you can synthesize an atomic read, modify, write from separate uh, read, modify, write. Like you can't, read the CSR, add one to it, uh, and write it back, and have that act atomically because the thing can be incrementing underneath you. And so if you want to do atomic operations, you have to actually expose them directly in the instruction set. So that's the motivation behind having these uh, read, modify, write instructions that behave atomically rather than just uh, offering load stores and then having you synthesize these operations from normal ALU ops. Um, I'm not going to go into huge detail about this um, because the basic instruction set doesn't have a lot of interesting red, uh, CSRs to talk about anyway. Um, but when we get into it, there will be a ton of low-level things um, that, that use these. So uh, stay tuned.
Like for example, if you're doing uh, exception handling or interrupt handling or something like that, um, there will generally be CSRs that hold the, you know, the equivalent of the link register, but from whatever instruction triggered the um, triggered the interrupt of the exception. So there, there's all kinds of low-level registers, and you can also put a lot of machine-specific registers that are not standard across architectures. Um, this is where they would go and how you would access them. And there's a whole story, although I think it's not described in the base ISA, but there's also a whole story for security around this stuff, because obviously you don't want um, very low-level registers that maybe control the page table location or other weird low-level things, like security-related things. You don't want those to be generally accessible. So there's a whole story around security and separation of, of privilege levels uh, for these kinds of things. And uh, that's not in the base ISA. That's specified in the privilege spec, uh, which we won't get to for a while, but uh, I will maybe allude to it sometimes. All right. That was a very long whirlwind tour of instructions. Uh, I didn't get to write any code, which was unexpected, uh, and I need to go and clear up my understanding of a few things with related to LUI and AddI with the sign extension stuff. Um, but hopefully, for people who are have have you know kind of C programmers who know maybe a little bit about x86 assembly, this was a helpful intro to sort of walk through and and get you thinking. Um, as always, uh, if you have questions, uh, I'll answer questions now if anyone has any. But uh, otherwise, uh, try to think about this on your on your own time and read through this and think through some of the examples I gave and uh, make sense of it. And if it doesn't make sense, write up questions and ask them on next stream, or you can <clears throat> ask on the forums maybe. So anyway, let me do Q and A and then I'll sign off. Um, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, Q A, Q A now. All right. Yeah, let's do QA. People are asking. Let's do QA. If anyone has questions, let's do QA. Um, but yeah. Too much talky talky for my taste, but uh, I think was actually necessary because I had to refresh my own memory on some of these things. And uh, people who haven't seen it before, they would probably need even more time for, to let things sink in. Someone's asking, what's my coding approach going to start as? My coding approach is basically, um, for this stuff, my plan is, um, like I said, we're going to do basically a reference suite of um, of different tools like an assembler, disassembler, debugger, and simulator that are using a lot of shared infrastructure for decoding and encoding. Um, and I think that's going to lead to a very clean separation of concerns, even though it may not be optimal for performance. And so that also lets me start working on things in pretty much any order. Um, so for example, if I do a basic encoder and decoder, using the encoder, I can hand, hand assemble certain instructions quite easily. Using the decoder, I can start executing very simple instructions and expand the instruction set uh, we support over time. I mean, it won't take very long to do all these instructions. Um, uh, but that, that's basically my plan, is to kind of co-implement all of these different things and use them to test each other. I should mention that one potential hazard a very real hazard that I actually ran into last time I tried this is that when you co-develop your whole tool chain, it's totally possible for con internal errors to occur that are consistent errors. Like for example, suppose I have a wrong notion of the instruction encoding, um, but it's consistently wrong throughout the entire tool chain, then everything will still work. Like for example, maybe I permute certain bits in the instruction encoding or something like that. That would, as long as I do it consistently, um, there would be no internally visible errors. And if they use, the more you use shared code, the more that's likely to happen. So one thing we'll have to do uh, sooner than later is to validate uh, things against third-party tools and third-party binary images that have been you know, written and assembled by other tools and making sure they behave correctly in our simulator and conversely assembling stuff with our assembler and testing it in another emulator to make sure it behaves as expected. But uh, for now, I'm planning on co-implementing all these different things and um, and um, and kind of bootstrapping like that, and then eventually starting to integrate other tools for cross-validation. So that's the plan. Alrighty. Yeah. So regarding the um, the uh, oh yeah, so that that makes total sense for the LUI and add I thing. Um, uh, Miyotatsu is saying he looked at bin utils and basically, yeah, what, that makes sense. So what you have to do is you don't have to add an extra instruction, but what you can do is you can pre-process the sign bit 
I guess, in order to take into account the cascading effect the sign extension would have and, um, and just compensate for that, I guess, in the immediate bits, um, which makes sense. Uh, I'll think about that off stream. Um, but anyways, um, all right. Dun, 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 dun. But yeah, that's pretty much what I have planned. I think I won't do an extra stream today because I, I was talking for two hours and I feel now pretty tired, two and a half hours almost. Uh, so this, I guess this will be like an extended length stream, right? so we don't need an extra stream. Um, but I guess Monday then we'll actually, we'll start coding now that we've actually covered the uh, the instructions we'll be implementing. Um, and maybe I'll do some, I'll probably do more study over the weekend, although I should probably take some time off as well. But um, let's say that next week is the absolutely official actually coding kickoff, and, and this turned into more of the talky-talky kickoff, and uh, Monday will be the real honest-to-goodness implementation kickoff, I guess. All right. It looks like we're uh, we're mostly done with questions. Um, if if you if you if other things come up and you want to ask me, uh, you can ask on Twitter, Discord, or the forums, uh, or keep your questions for next time's Q and A. So I'm out, and uh, everyone have a good weekend. I'll see you on Monday or Sunday, depending on whether you're in the U.S. or not. <laughs>